lucky to have Andrea here today. I first met her when her professor, Professor Ellen Hubler, who I hear now is married, might have a slightly different name, <laughs> uh, at Cornell College. They came down to talk to me originally about some of the historical photographs in our collections and just about art. And I asked Andrea uh, why she came to Cornell, and it's partly because they have those intensive study periods, and, and when, so she was recruited out of her high school, this was the college she chose, even though many other schools were after her. She did this project as her honors thesis. Uh, she graduated from Cornell with a Bachelor of Art in Art History and a Bachelor of Science minor in Chemistry. She is currently working at Doorstep Digital in Houston, Texas as a digital archivist and executive assistant. She hopes to maybe return to Iowa. Somehow we've caught her favor. Uh, she published an article on this topic in the Iowa History Journal in January, February of 2015, if you'd like to pick that up. So join me in welcoming Andrea, and let's see what she's got to tell us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mary Bennett, about that introduction. Um, I am uh, really honored to be here. Um, I, I mean, first of all, I would like to thank Mary Bennett again for having me here. Um, if it wasn't for her encouragement of uh, pursuing a topic of Iowa um, history, then I probably wouldn't have found it. this amazing early piece of work, uh, which took me so long and is still an obsessive habit of mine to keep researching about. Um, secondly, I would like to thank the art history department um, and the art department at Cornell College for being here. Um, they're my support, um, even after a year of, of being out of college. And then lastly, I would like to thank Mr. Swagner, the editor of the Iowa History Journal, for not only pushing me to, to get it published um, early on, but to um, continue looking out for, his, for journal um, topics for his, for his journal. So, I would like to propose that not only do we look at the specific scene that we have here, um, vigilantes, and we have dispersing the mob on the east wall, but we're also going to be discussing, on a very superficial level, the role of the arts in the government, the Stone City itself, and um, the artist's response along with the past and present criticism and praises of this mural cycle, not just of this scene. So, the WPA and the Great Depression. In 1930, Rose, President Roosevelt presented the idea of four New Deal art programs, the Public Works of Art Program, the Treasury Relief Art Project, the Section of Painting and Sculpture, and then we have Works Progress Administration, later renamed Works Project Administration, or Works Progress in 1939. So what exactly was the theme, or what exactly was the purpose of these four New Deal art programs? There were themes that Americans could relate to during this time of struggle. There were themes to glorify um, and sort of uplift the spirit, and then to also financially support artists and, and members that were struggling to, to meet ends. There's an inward shift of influence in terms of um, the art projects that we have here. There's a renewed appreciation of artists um, in the U.S. and their merits. And in order to make art more American, art more accessible and more to the public and more democratic. It is not typical that these WPA murals uh, are, are there to confront social and political issues, even though they're, they strive to be a little more political than, than what we expect to be. So in terms of how that plays with these artists, <coughs> they present a different perceived truthfulness at this time. And not just from one, but from five different artists. There's a clash of histories and judgments, a clash of the old and new. So let me talk about a little more of Stone City and its controversy. As what you may or may not know, Grand Wood was in charge of Stone City um, Art School and Colony, along with John Stuart Curry, Thomas Benton, uh, we also have Marvin Cohn, um, who were faculty members of the time. They encouraged artists to not only come to the Midwest, but to, if they couldn't travel abroad, um, to look more inwards. The curriculum was set on embracing the local and the scenery, as we see in Grand Wood Stone City, 1930. So it discouraged any abstract or imaginary 
or subjective painting. So the typical, typical imagery we see is the farms, the countryside. Um, we also see uh, villages, um, and we'll see more so um, how that differs in the mural cycle and more so in, in Everett's wall. And so what, what he represented in, in these, mur the, these regionalist paintings, murals, was that regionalism was a matter of commitment to locale and, and not a style. So he turned to promote regionalism nationwide, sort of to portray a rural Eden of America, to pretend not so much the grotesque horrors of the Great Depression of the time, but to present it where anyone can relate to the, to the scene, anyone can relate to the, the happiness of, of being part of America, um, not just during the, the trials. And so Wood suggested to Curry and to, to Benton to return to their hometown to, in, to inspire more artists to, to reach out and to go and to be a m more uh, regionalist and sort of portray America in, in a new light. But Stone City was not without controversy. So faculty grew less tolerant of these little woods, which would mean that because Wood had such an influence over his students, they would mimic his, his style and mimic their, their faculty styles, and that's the criticism that they got. With they, they couldn't tolerate that. You would get the same imagery all over again. In 1935, 21 of their students petitioned against Wood and sent that petition to, to Washington, D.C., the headquarters of the WPA, only because Wood had discouraged their creativity. Quote, this is one from their students, what they thought, um, that he was sort of discouraging them from the mural that they were working on, uh, and they had to pretend it the way that regionalism was all about. Promptly, Wood resigned as the state's director, never to work at any federal art program again. And then we have um, his, his most typical um, regionalist uh, art that we're aware of is American Gothic from 1930. Um, and we have a picture of him with Curry um, at Stone City in 1933. So these are the five artists that were in charge of the murals. These were part of the five artists that, were, that broke away who fought against the idea of the typical uh, wood um, tie of style of teaching. So we have Francis Robert White, <coughs> Everett Jeffrey, and Arnold Pyle, our fellow Iowans. And then we have Johnson, actually Jones, um, and he's from Indiana and Glassell is from Denmark. <coughs> so we have a, a wide range of people who know about Iowa history and people who don't. So we have that sort of commonality of trying to portray America from two different perspectives. And it was basically Francis Robert White who sparked that debate of Wood's teaching and influence methods. And like I said, they had broke away and formed a cooperative in 1934-35 in Cedar Rapids. The Cooperative Mural Painters of Iowa, later known as the Cooperative Mural Artists, functioned under the Treasury Relief Art Project, one of the New Deal art programs that I had mentioned earlier in 1936. And it was White who had been a spokesperson I was chosen to head the Works Progress Administratum at the time in Iowa. So how is it that they received the commission to, to actually paint in the post office? Well, there is a discrepancy of how they were actually chosen. There is a financial need, which they were rewarded if they competed about for the, for the walls and for the federal buildings. And there is merit-based. So that discrepancy of the quality of who deserved it more or who, who actually earned it uh, put a strain on the quality of the work. So now that quality of the work falls on not the responsibility of the WPA, not necessarily, but the overseer of the time of that work. Johnson Jones, um, he was actually commissioned the post office. Um, and because of uh, a former faculty member of the Stone City, and previous director of the little gallery, Edward Rowan, um, they stepped in and helped them actually, com com actually compete for the rest of the, the item, for the rest of the location. So at first, Rowan had restricted John, the, actually the cooperative to just the post office, which is the main lobby and the first floors. 
but he changed his mind not only to include the courtroom on the third floor, as only as long as White was in charge of supervising that mural cycle. So, talking a little more of the location, how they got it, um, plans proposed versus plans actually executed. These, these artists actually had to submit preliminary sketches to the WPA before anything was finalized. And we see that they completed, for the most part, 80% of their sketches, which means that the, the remaining 20% actually changed last minute. And whether or not the WPA approved is really unclear without the proper documentation. So the cooperative was pretty much criticized for, idealized, for the idealized imaging um, that regionalists presented. And they wanted to bring awareness to chains of events that are too late to prevent, but too soon to forget. So these murals then become a microcosm of America, the history of where they've been and where they're going to. Um, and so that's, that's one of the other issues is that, does it really represent Iowa or is it, does it really represent America? And at the time, you wanted to sort of be uh, rooting for your own town. And smaller, smaller locations had found it harder to find the funding to, to actually support um, history of that hometown. So the influences that actually drove these uh, artists um, stemmed from the Mexican, the Mexican muralist and uh, partly regionalism as well. In 1920, President Alvarado Obregón had turned wall, endless walls of public buildings with events of Mexican history back to Mayan and Aztec in order to reclaim a Mexican identity. And isn't that what they're doing now? Aren't they trying to reclaim an identity that's trying to fight against what's typical uh, of the time? And so, I mean, Americans believe that, they had, that the, the Mexicans had created the greatest school since the Italian Renaissance in terms of muralism. But by the 1920s and the 1930s, the Mexicans and the Mexican muralists and the regionalists reached their zenith in popularity. So they were both collaborating in terms of being outspoken activists for trying to present a new identity of America and presenting social history and the, the turmoil of, of history at the time. And looking at the following mural cycle that I presented here, a myriad of different stylistic styles and then historical factors influence the creation. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to explain them as best as I can. I don't think you're able to see us properly, but so the north is gonna be the wall that white um, was known to complete. The frontier, just frontier prairie has, oh, it has a depiction of a Native American woman hunched over, echoing the sort of the teepee, almost as she's carrying her culture on her back, literally. She's echoing the teepee. And then we have a, a grotesque depiction of a Native, Native American who, uh, it's almost like the anatomy of his form is, is really just showing his muscles, his weakness, his just, he's really uh, desolate. And it's, overwhelmed by the, the sort of the expansion of, of America, of taking over. Then we have the Indian village empire. Um, well, we, we, we can see that there is a wagon um, and then the dying cattle. Um, and there's the flag there that symbolizes that they've, they've captured the land and that they're claiming it as their own. We have the expansion primitive water and steamboat. And it just depicts uh, the transportation at the time, um, what they're doing and how they're getting um, to and fro. We have the railroad builders um, breaking back labor. Um, and that's where, I mean, we are trying to communicate that we're going from the east and west and we're trying to discover more land and trying to, to expand it um, for ourselves. Then we have the Midwest farm, a typical Iowa and corn. Um, then we have the barn in the corner. And then we finally on that wall, we have a developmental power and it's conversion for industrial use. Um, and it just has like a and sort of an engine of some sort, um, machine that helps them sort of do, do the labor um, and harvest the crops. And if we're 
going to have to discuss a meaning or if there's a connection with any of these walls. The north wall best connects with the south wall. The south wall has three main sort of areas, uh, the modern Mexican culture, and that's, when, that's the one that sort of pays homage to the Mexican muralist, um, Jose Clemente Orozco, by presenting the modern s migration of the spirit. And for those that aren't aware of, of what that actually artwork is, um, it has Jesus cutting down his own cross um, and actually uh, sort of attacking the atrocities and uh, acknowledging the, the political and the religious um, um, challenges that, that he's facing um, to overcome um, his issues. Um, and next to that, and it's upside down, uh, but the inherited culture, uh, we see an architecture, uh, we see the architecture of Teotihuacan and uh, Chichen Itza, um, the documentation of that, discovering the land and being able to actually document that, um, sort of the expansion of the time and um, past civilizations and how they've influenced um, how we view others, other cultures. Next to that we have uh, an archaeologist digging uh, for a vessel. Um, it looks uh, to be a sort of a pottery, typical um, pre-Columbian influence. Um, to want to page almost to that. So uh, we trace not our roots, but it's sort of the history of where, where art comes from. And then lastly, we have the materials progression. Um, foods inherited, the typical, the typical bean, um, squash, um, corn, uh, that we, we value so much and that we, we have here. Um, so it's best, they best complement each other in the sense that we're talking about where do we come from and where do we get our inspiration in terms of uh, not only art, but of, uh, of food, of where we get our nourishment, where we get our, um, our inspiration from, who we admire, the Mexican muralist, uh, Mexican culture at the time, in terms of just art, um, and so forth. The East and the West, it's hard to make that connection only because they were, they were rushed to finish the, the project on time. Um, so as you can see, th those scenes that I was really working on um, sort of best complements the police department. And what does that mean? Is that the police are there to keep order and to serve eyes. Um, but directly across from it, we, we see the opposite of that. We see violence. We see uh, abuse of authority and over the minority. Um, next to that, dispersing the mob, we sort of contradict that with the fire department. And that's a giant leap to make. But if I, if I had to take a guess, um, the fire department um, doesn't necessarily pertain to that, only if we're talking about drawing crowds. Um, they are trying to protect us, um, and so is this person, the mob, when you see the actual image. But the way it's portrayed doesn't actually show that it's actually helpful, that they're just person, the mob, or at least that the police officers are helpful. Um, and I'll go back to the, to the east wall, and we have superstition and alchemy. Um, and that just has imagery of uh, these bird-like masks on um, almost performing some alchemy, some um, ritual of sort. And then we have a, a man who has his head over a woman's head and is praying. Uh, so for surgery, we have uh, sort of experiments going on in the background, and then we have an actual surgery being performed. And then we have um, the movies, which is with the one that I was talking about, how 20% of the of the mural cycle was changed at the very end. So what it actually depicts the movies isn't actually with Sear. Um, and they had recently discovered that uh, the newspaper clippings were damaged well enough that you actually can't make out with Sear, um, which means that they were really trying really hard to get rid of the newspaper clippings. Um, a couple of them were talking about the venereal disease, um, Sweden defeats syphilis, and then they have the typical play ball. And let me go back to the free speech. That's the other one that gets changed out, because that was actually um, a, pr a protest. So we have the protest, we have the vigilantes, we have this person, the mob, and then we go down to um, sort of the venereal disease and so forth. And so let me finish off the, um, the west wall. So I already covered the police and the fire department. Um, the, and then we have the relief project labor sort of giving homage to um, what the WPA was all about, sort of helping the, the people that needed it the most, not just artists, but sort of um, people who could work on with buildings, construction, um, infrastructure. We have the Release Projects Professionals just giving, sort of lending out um, hand 
um, in terms of help. And then much like the East Wall, we ha where it's free speech and the movies, the corner walls of the West Wall have returned to labor and popular education and the press. So they made, the f the, they made decisions to change the last ones. Um, one was depicting sort of the carnage and after a, aftermath of a battle. And then popular education, um, that was more a commentary with spree speech. So what is the big deal about the whole mural cycle? Not just my, the one thing that I did focus on. There's a contradiction between authority and imagery. There's a contradiction of uh, the past and the, and the, and the, the future, where we're heading to. Um, and it's, it's really about a legacy that outlives its physical form. Even before these walls were uncovered, they were talk, well talked about um, in newspapers um, and in journals. So let me go back and actually start with the scene that I narrated on. We're gonna start with that. So I was able to go back last night and actually take pictures of the newly uncovered east wall. So, um, so the first wall that was uncovered is the north wall. The second one was the south wall. And then three years later, we, got to, we actually get to see the, the east wall. And I had sat in the jury box to see what it actually was, to see the, the actual image um, from their perspective. Um, and that's where it's, it's lent itself, where it's so controversial. It's just, is it really an accurate depiction of Iowa justice? Is it really something that happened here? Is it something that, that we can still relate to or not? Is there a need for vigilantism um, at that time? And it made it much more real, the, the struggle to understand or to try to understand why there is uh, the deal to cover them up. Um, not just an aesthetic point of view, but a practical point of view. Is it, could it be distracting at some point during a trial? Could it be uh, just, a, or, or is it inappropriate? There's a, a distinguish between being inappropriate and being a distraction. And so the Chronicles of the American Civilization are dedicated, in that scene, are dedicated to the evolution of the justice system. It's approximately 10 feet by five feet, so it's really, it takes up a lot of space when you're in, in, when you're in front of it. Um, and it's, 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 yeah, it's pretty, it makes you feel small. I felt small being in front of it, just seeing it in person. And what is it we're actually seeing here? So we're actually seeing, so, let me see if I have a better picture. There it is. So we have, we have sort of a complementary subject matter going on. There's a dialogue between the two scenes. We have vigilantes. What we see is that we have a court, what we see like a courthouse or a holding room that links us to, to view the rope, which l ties really new, like ties uh, on the neck of the, of the figure, of the criminal. We have the vigilantes sort of creating and framing um, our viewpoint to see that this is a moment where they're taking matters into their own hand, that law is too slow. And so in the next scene, we see sort of a symmetry of, we see an echo of the figure of the policeman um, who could potentially be, uh, take matters into his own hand as well. Um, we see uh, the echo of the figures, we see them waiting as if this is the moment before they go into the courtroom. You see the criminal uh, behind the, the criminal, I don't know if I'm fine. The criminal behind this figure right here waiting. Um, and then we see, what I didn't notice before is that we see this figure pointing the gun to someone's head. Uh, so it's, it's almost a menace to, to the society of, even though they're supposed to be there to protect the, the criminal, they're there to protect themselves um, first and fo foremost. And so it's, it's really neat. And the one thing that was really hard at first is that we couldn't tell without the color of the palette what the actual race of the criminal was. And so if I, if I tell you it's, it's the lynching, you're immediately gonna think it, it's the racial discrimination with, towards the black person. And that's what I expected to hear um, 
and so I stayed away from that. And it's, it was when I talked to Mel and Dringa about it, we, we agreed that it was going to be uh, really hard for people to distinguish that. And so we just stayed with the frontier justice. And so, I mean, typically it is a lynching, but we're in this case, we're, we're calling it frontier justice because that's really what it is. Um, they're taking matters into their own hand. And so it's, it's really hard to find any documentation from the artists themselves in terms of what he actually meant. Um, there is documentation of other walls, but not necessarily this wall. So it's really a loose interpretation of what could be happening here. But it is uh, sort of a transition between the past of the Old West type of frontier justice and what we have now, which is sort of the police officers trying to calm down a criminal or trying to calm down a mob before they take matters into their own hands. And so, in order to develop an American, an original American art based on social issues and the human struggle for survival, I think the answer does lie in now in the destroyed in the mob. Not only does it attempt in a loose way to say that uh, there's a shift from the power of the people to the state where they're in control. And then there is an imminent threat of, um, that you really can't discard, um, that the officers may or may not be in charge after all. And the placement of the mural is crucial in order to appreciate what, what's going on here. Um, I had showed you that there was the picture that I had taken was from the jury box, sort of as a reminder <coughs> that the jury was to uphold the law. So they have one wrong verdict, and it really could create chaos, and the mob could, the, potentially the mob could take back the control. And how do we not see that happening today? Like literally, how do we not see that? So I'll ask that question one more time. Is it an incorrect representation of the justice in Iowa at the time? Or is it more of, of a commentary that this literally could be happening anywhere in America at this time? Or maybe still, or maybe not. When you see it in color, let me go back. I don't think everybody see it. If we see it in color, we see that it's, it's technically a white person. And there, there are reports that Iowa is known to, to have lynched more whites than blacks. So they had done their careful research, um, but it's really hard to say what's going on and if, if it actually is a, a lynching in Iowa, if it's just a generic um, example. And these are more in-depth um, and a closer an examination of the North Wall, where I showed you the just sort of the portrayal of the Indian um, and the, the Native American Indian and the Native American woman in the corner. Um, we see the the heartbreaking labor that uh, the men uh, immigrants had to do in order to get to make progress in the country in terms of transportation. And then we have uh, the typical scene of of Iowa. It's not as grandiose as as what grew it. That's as what would would represent it as, but it, it is what um, is happening from their truthfulness. This is the current North Wall in, in sort of live moment in terms of the council chamber. Um, the color isn't as accurate with the, it's not as whitewashed, um, but the colors that the conservatives were able to sort of remove um, they're so, they're in your face and they're really, they're really bright. Um, the reds stand out a lot more, uh, and especially with the Native Americans and the anatomy of his body and how he's in, he's in pain um, and how he's just so um, almost beaten down. And this is the whole, sort of the whole uh, cycle of the East Wall. Uh, and like I said, the corner where there should have been a freeze, like a sort of a protest, um, turns out to be more of uh, uh, typical um, jobs of a banker, of a farmer, um, anyone working in the industry of that. Let me go on to see the, more specifically, you see the, the figures that are praying um, 
figures that are praying here and then the bird-like figures and then the, also the alchemy going on behind that wall. And this is the other change where it's, where we see that the, uh, not only do we not see the movies, which is a typical um, enjoyment of the time where if you want to get distracted, that's where you would go. Uh, but we see a doctor educating a, for a naked, uncivilized person about the, the venereal disease, disease of uh, just pretty much health care. So the different social contexts mix about the mixed reactions. And then once more, this is the south wall. Um, the homage to um, Orozco, um, the vessel, the documentation of architecture, of land, um, of an Iowa hill, and you're seeing the discovery of a vessel, um, and then you're seeing sort of the triumvirate of food-wise of corn, squash, and beans. The south wall in color, um, once again, and that's uh, Orozco at the Dartmouth College um, Baker Library. Um, on the right, and that's actually the the corner of that, the south wall. And then this is the west wall where we actually don't know much about yet. Um, the lunettes, the half domes, they have biblical sense of um, they're just sort of displaying their authority. Um, they're knowledgeable. Um, they're all about the books. That they're all about history. And then we see in that very far corner on this right, we see that we see the, the sort of the, the end of the battlement, the return to labor. But how does that really represent labor? The aftermath of, of carnage. Thankfully, there were some newspaper clippings, Melendringan and Edward McManus, who was a senior judge at the time, who gave me a contemporary look at the significance this mural cycle had. Um, this isn't one of them, but this is more of a later one. But uh, in 1937, a couple months after the mural, was mural cycle was completed, the mural cycle agrees federal staff again, judge disapproves. So in 1937, um, judge Scott disapproves. So he's, more, he's telling, he's saying that it's more of a distraction. They're not, the jurors aren't capable of completing their jobs. And then we have there's more of a talk of the deadline. Was this a forced work? Um, there's a completely, almost a lack of coherency in the mural cycle because um, they were trying to match each other's quality of work. And then decades later, we have federal judge who is senior now, who is now senior judge, Edward McManus, spoke about the reception. So it went from being inappropriate to being more of a distraction, which indicates that society is capable of looking past the literal imagery, and more so if we choose to be more objective about history. And then this is one of the later ones, 1956. We have uh, another judge who has, uh, who doesn't believe that these murals are worthy of being um, public publicized. And then he's saying that they're trying to be removed, if possible, and sent to the regional office of the General Service Administration in Kansas City. But how is it possible, how, how can you try to remove these huge, walls who have these, it's physically impossible to try to remove. They can try to destroy and damage them and whitewash them, but you really can't physically remove them. And this is from 1972. This is just talking about the bottom. Um, it's just paying homage to the, um, sort of a, the story of a detective of trying to search uh, for more mules out there that depict Iowa history, or, or maybe not so much of Iowa history, but just of the time period. And then we have where, it's my favorite topic, um, Greg Narber had, had published Iowa of Journals from 1986 to 2006, and it really was a collective of 200 murals in Iowa um, during the WPA that represented um, Iowa in, in post offices and schools um, out in the public. But these, uh, these women decide to go and actually search for themselves. And they follow his, his work as a travel guide, and they travel all through Iowa, and they talk to the town folk. And that's exactly what, what I was capable of doing. I was able to talk to, to the judge who had ordered the murals to be covered up. 
and to ask him why he why he asked him to be um, to be covered up. And so before we, I get to the sort of the now sort of the the claims and the the responses um, from the society, um, I'll have to go back and discuss a little more what the artists themselves defended about their work. So in 1937, White had had said as a response to, to a critic his quote art does not stir the simple minded folk but because the artwork encourages the thought and appreciation of an advancing culture for those that are willing to understand so he's aware that for people who are going to be so literal about the, the imagery um, in all the walls not just there necessarily in just a jeffrey wall the east wall um, he appreciates those that, that go beyond it and who, who, aren't aff who don't take offense to that type of depiction of what could be the truth at the time. He questions the juror's inability to relate to familiar contemporary scenes. He elaborates the subject matter, which stem from, quote, careful research, end quote, and then direct study of existing form. And he wanted to sort of do it in a color which stood out so in your face that wasn't um, making it seem so idealized and so um, rural, like a rural Eden. And then it was much more, more closely related to the authentic mural tradition where they were painting directly onto the wall and that would last for, for years on end. And then Don Glassell, who completed the West Wall um, had wanted the report to provide more information to the public before any more sarcastic remarks were made. The accomplishment of that time period was not a copy of what had done before. There's really no other wall or mural cycle that depicts history that way. And if there is, they, they're t mostly talking about the injustice towards Native Americans, um, injustice towards, towards African Americans. And then they talk about how they're aware that the criticisms that they face aren't necessarily directed to them, but the WPA. And to be able to discredit the truly social program for the cultural works, if it could, does not give the report of the, the respect that they need. And so let's go ahead and go, go ahead to the restoration that happened um, recently. So as of 2011, the North Wall is completed. Though so you see the end of the Native American that I was just describing, um, as sort of an idea, sort of the idea that they're now being receptive to this art mural, that they're now accepting it for what it is, not for what it was, um, sort of that commentary on, um, on violence, but it's a history that's really uh, crucial to understand and to really um, value. And these, after so long, had been whitewashed. So in 1930, um, Scott disapproves, uh, Judge Scott disapproves. In the early 1950s, um, Judge Gravin has the murals whitewashed with latex paint. And then the early 1960s, George, uh, Senior Judge McManus uncovers them and then decides to have them painted over. And, the, and he has Marvin Cohn and two other art experts come in and make that decision for him. He just he felt that he didn't have the artistic authority to have them covered up. And I had mentioned earlier that Marvin Cohn had been a sort of a former faculty member at the Stone City. So that means he was, he was really close friends with Grant Wood. And for someone to represent Iowa in a different light than what is typical of Grant Wood, I mean, it gave them a little more motive to, to have it covered up. And who was going to defend these artists who had broken away from, from Grant Wood, Stone City. And so when I did, when I did talk to Senior Judge McManus about two, maybe a year and a half ago, he had stood by that decision to have Marvin Cohn um, and to the two art experts go ahead and cover it up because there was really no artistic or historical value to them. And then he, he goes on to say that 
he wasn't aware of the legal term that Judge uh, Gravin had presented of moral turpitude, and that moral turpitude is a legal term. Er an inherent baseness, vileness, or depravity with respect to a person's duty or to, to, an, to society in general. He was just completely shocked by that. But he still stood by his decision to have it covered up. So it calls into question the autistic decision um, that it wasn't based on that, but more of a practicality for senior judge McManus. Um, he, as he put it, he thought of it as a television show. Um, I mean, he's well into his 90 now, and so for him to remember this mural, is, it's really, really impressive and he, how he still remembers how he covered it up with, with Marvin Cohn. So after the 2008 flood, that's where even more talks about the historical significance of these murals come about. The General Service Administration handed over the, the old f courtroom slash post office to Cedar Rapids in exchange for the land where the new courthouse was built as long as the walls were to be restored. So we have the, sort of the, the promises kept where we see the north wall being restored in 2011, the south wall restored in 2012, and then we have the east wall rest restored as of April 2015 of this year. So the last wall, there's really no talk about the West Wall just yet, because funding does take a while. It's, it's about 120 grand each of the, for the walls to get uncovered, and it takes time, and it takes that effort uh, for conservatives to, to come in and um, try to match up where each of the scenes are. And this is the panorama. Uh, oh, you can't see it really well, but um, it's the North, East, and South Wall all completed and sort of the, the, the grandness of it and to be sort of enveloped in sort of the, the history, or a history, typically, um, of the artist's truth, um, it's pretty, pretty impressive in a sense. And then fellow Melandringa um, and I had a conversation about this, the mural cycle, um, and he's quoted to sort of believe that the, there's a historical balance, even if it may not be politically correct which means that the subject contradicts the Woods rear view regionalism of Iowa and America. The generic topics uh, may not represent Iowa, but they possibly could represent America. But we do have the topical scenes where the movies and the newspaper clippings do represent pivotal moments in our history, whether it's the he healthcare, um, that can be tied to an actual, actual scene. We're talking about the frontier justice lynching of a sense, the rule of law that gives the power to the federal, state cover, the federal court system as to objectively deliberate justice. But we really don't see that, even though that's what they want us to, to challenge. Um, it's sort of that, the evolution of law. The ambiguity of the criminal's identity was intentional, sort of, we're highlighting the mentality of the mob and not so much of the, of the victim. Because um, we can see our, ourselves in the mob. We're, we're technically impl like implicated that we're viewers. We're letting it happen. Um, I mean, these, these are two, these are, these are chains of events that are too soon to forget. And so paperwork from the, from the US General Administration indicates that the murals lost fever for either one reason. They thought either the artwork was inferior to other WPA era artwork, or it took off into literally just that scene where we see the lynching happening. But not only can we focus so much on the, on the actual vigilante and dispersing the mob, we all, it also teaches us to sort of broaden the view of why do certain murals get saved and others don't? Who defends these artists and who defends the history that they represent? Are we too scared to, uh, to really understand art and to, to allow it to say something that we're not used to or uncomfortable with? And it's not uncommon. 
there's a lot of artwork at this time that, that represents that the evolution of law that we're not used to seeing or that we choose not to see. Further studies on similar Iowa murals may show how politics influenced the acceptance of these works. So we see that we see that shift of acceptance from it being so much of a an appropriate mural to it being a distraction to it being a piece of history that we're more than capable of understanding if we choose to do so. It also implicated that active participants in history that not only was this maybe happening during our lifetime, or maybe your lifetime or my lifetime, but that it's, it's a way of preserving history on a wall that we can read. And so it's entering our consciousness of, are we going to accept art that challenges what we think is the norm? Are we gonna challenge what we think is history? Are we gonna challenge what artists say just because we may not approve of what it actually, what it is. So it's reconstructing a moment in which law and culture were founded at the expense of others. We see the labor, we see, we see justice, we see injustice, we see um, civilizations that we see, that we show respect to or that we, we can relate to. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I was wondering. Is it on? Yes, it's on. Okay. Um, I was wondering whether the use of the space has affected um, both the covering up and now, more recently, the funding for unveiling the artwork. I mean, what is the space used for now as opposed to what it was? So back then it was used as a courtroom. So they had trials going on, you see the dais, and now it's so much as a meeting room. Um, you see the community can, and can actually sit in there. Um, it's not so much a, a problem of distraction. Um, I mean, they're aware of it, they're not gonna cover it up, um, but they are trying to Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure how that, how that actually plays. Um, I guess if you can rephrase that question, I can probably yeah. better. Okay. Um, if this was a space that was used for court cases in the past, would there be a greater concern about distractions, particularly with um, a jury looking at the dialogue between the mob or the people, the vigilantes and the police officers where, yeah, whereas now, I'm assuming, you'll have to tell me, but I'm assuming there are no more court cases and no more juries sitting there looking at that subject. You're absolutely, yeah, correct. Um, obviously, the position where it's the location of the jury box um, across from these vigilantes, across from the mob and dispersing the mob, um, we do see that the judges feared that there was gonna be more of a distraction. It was gonna be uh, an impediment um, that they were going to be scared that if they make the wrong ver verdict that the mob was either going to sort of turn on them or turn on the actual criminal. Um, now, not so much. There's, there's t meetings there, but it's not so much that they're distracted. I mean, they're, they're aware of it. They're not going to be as distracted as, as back then. Um, so it does play a huge role that the change of being a courtroom into, into a meeting hall, it changes the, sort of the how, how are we going to be... Uh, appalled if we're going to be appalled i mean it's there we're, are we going to be cool about it yeah i think we are um we can look at it just i think so can, can i just respond to that a second to that question it currently is the city council it's currently the city council chambers people don't know how to read murals anymore so they're fairly they're they're fairly irrelevant to the viewer to the people in the in the um, in, in, when a council meeting is is going on, but if we read the back mural behind the city council, that's more controversial now than the than the hanging is. 
Uh, you have a story of the oppression of Native um, uh, Americans replaced by for, forts and 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 then slaves working uh, on the on the Mississippi coolies uh, building the transcontinental railroad replaced by family farms industrialization and tenement and if you see that as the view of the history of American culture, and it sits behind your city council. The potential is that that's a that that's a controversial reading of, of things. But nobody knows how to read left to right anymore, and as a result, nobody pays any attention to what you know to the the cartoon balloons above their head. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you interviewed Judge McManus and that he said that this was like television, or could you tell us a little bit about uh, more about what he said about justifying his decision to cover these up or what he meant by it was like television? That sounds intriguing. Well, he did say that he didn't have any uh, artistic authority to make that decision of covering it up or not, but he, in that sense that it, the television, it's a distraction. Um, he, did, he did believe that he, they need to be washed, they need to be uh, whitewashed. Um, he had it uncovered because he was curious at first, but when he realized that it could indeed be a distraction, that's when he had had it covered up again. I, I learned something from the restorer. Uh, I learned something from the restorer a couple of weeks ago, and that is that that the the second uncovering of our the first uncovering of the murals was almost accidental. They had, they, had, uh, they had intended to redecorate the courtroom, and the first coating on the murals was one that could be removed easily. And so when they started to wash the walls, some of the f figures started to appear underneath the, uh, underneath the paint. And it was at that point that they decided, Judge McManus decided to make a separate uh, evaluation of the uh, of the murals and brought in experts to give give him opinion. Now that was an, an aesthetic evaluation. The first evaluation of it by Judge Graven, Craven, which is oddly and, and I, I will make a little correct one little thing. I think it's oddly that his name is Craven. It's just like you know fine, but uh, he did not say it was moral turpitude that caused him to change the mur the, the the things he said it was mural turpitude it was a joke that he made about that he was suffering from mural turpitude he called he said it so he was making kind of a, a reference to the fact that he was receiving constant complaints from lawyers defense attorneys and prosecutors about the contents of the murals opposite the thing so in effect that first the first change of the murals was for kind of uh, yeah political reasons you you you, you might say it, it it was it was the content was influencing things the second time it was covered up was because of a aesthetic decision and I would say in 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 the last the last decision it, it because of the neither aesthetics or or morals are a factor now it's a, it's being it's being accepted as a cultural artifact and so you have a, a third a third reason if it ever gets covered up it'll be covered up because it's uh, you know it's out of out of date or you know it's just it's just an old thing but i think it'll be preserved because of that now it's just seen as a a, a balance and antidote to grant woods I was curious whether you found other examples. I, I might be wrong about this, but I thought the Woodbury County Courthouse also masked over a portion of their mural because it was considered offensive. And did you have any parallel stories like that? Well, not necessarily in Iowa. Um, I am aware of particularly the there's a courthouse in Idaho, um, and that portrays sort of the discrimination and sort of injustice towards Native Americans once again. Um, and instead of having that mural covered up, um, and I had mentioned it to Mr. Sherman in the background um, that they had just put a cloth over it. And for eight years, it was hidden behind a flag. <laughs> and so um, when they actually uncovered it and they realized that it was actually there, they had um, the community come together, the five nations of, of Native Americans there, and they created a catalog 
that goes along with the with the depiction of the Native Americans there. So it's sort of a their sort of contribution to what is actually being depicted and how they feel about it. But I did, haven't been. There, there possibly is in Iowa. I just haven't had a chance to actually broaden the the scope of of comparison just yet. My one destroyed at the state fairgrounds. Yep. I think the Woodbury County one might have had a swastika or something in it. So then after World War II, they wanted to cover it up. A couple of other quick comments is that we have a collection here by a man named Paul Black that Benjamin Shambo had do a research study on lynching in Iowa. And he did a survey of all the counties in Iowa. There was quite a bit of lynching. It was usually horse thieves. And it was usually white people. And so that, that's probably where that's possibly being derived from. And the other comment, which I'm sure you were astute enough to notice, is the so-called bird-like creatures you refer to are actually representing the plague in Europe. And that was, a, if you saw films or pictures, those are what the attending physicians would wear in order to not get contaminated by that. And that is part of that period of superstition and things. But it's really fascinating to, to dissect all the different parts of this. And, and uh, it's a lot of information to digest. So does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? This is a, uh, a question, but s some of you may remember the incident in Maine that was p reported on uh, NPR recently about uh, the Department of Labor, I believe, but in, in one of the main buildings, they depicted labor in a favorable light, and the new man that took over the department thought it was uh, inappropriate to be uh, to show labor in a favorable light, so he had that mural covered up. Um, and there was a pushback on that, and I guess I don't know how it was resolved, but uh, that, that's just within the last two years. And then a positive thing that happened in Iowa, uh, there was a farming scene, a mural that was in a post office in St. Louis. And they closed the post office and they didn't know what to do with the mural. And someone working at the federal court building in Des Moines uh, was able to bring the mural from St. Louis and get it installed at the at the federal court building uh, in Des Moines, and uh, not not many people are aware of that. Thank you again, Andrea, for giving us this wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Watching City Channel 4 on TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.